Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this evening's presentation. Um, just um, quickly, a couple of things in from the Scientific Society. As you see here with the PowerPoint presentations, there's a couple of presentations currently online, which will be happening this week, Thursday, and also uh, next week. Um, then we've still got one space for one car for the Luderitz Wolfers Bay tour. So if there's anybody of you interested to take part that, in that tour, please do let me know. Um, then we are looking for pictures of our building. If there are any members out there who have possibly pictures of the building, considering that this building was pretty much built 110 years ago, we hope that there are some pictures from some years ago. Um, next, what you see here is part of the work that is kind of his fault. So he came here last year and accidentally found the stone tool collection and said he urgently needs it catalogued and digitized. <laughs> Very urgently. So he got us a little bit of funding and we got on it. Uh, you can see at the back on the table, there are some samples of these boxes. Uh, these boxes were donated by Mr. Fiereck in the late seventies. So where they, they were happily lying safe in the scientific society for a couple of years till we started cataloging them last year. They are now digitized, cataloged, and uh, available to see online on our Koha database. Um, it was quite a long project, and I hope he's going to have a look at it tomorrow and tell us that it was a good work that we did. We try to be very meticulous on this work, and I think it's quite important um, work that has been done and hopefully ho helps a lot of researchers in the future. So much from our side. Um, I think now it's time for today. So Dr. George Lido was here apparently two years ago already, so time really flies by very quickly, giving a presentation on the project that he's been working on for several years now. And today he's going to give us an update on what he has been doing and uh, the results that have been found. And I think without further ado, oh, Firstly, I'm going to just hand over the list that we please all put the names down, but then I'm going to give the microphone to Dr. Leader to please introduce himself, his project quickly, and uh, what he did, what he accomplished, and what he's going to do. Thank you, Ruth. I appreciate that. Thank, thank you, everybody, for, for coming out this evening. Um, let me. No, I'm not going to be able to find this. I'm going to let the, the technology experts pull it up here. There it is. Perfect. Thank you. So um, my name is George Leader, and I lead a team in uh, archaeological research in the San Sea. Um, that team includes uh, some international uh, collaborations. As you can see, some of there are affiliations. Dr. Ted Marks, Dr. Abby Stone, Dr. Rachel Bino. Uh, Ted is at the um, New Orleans Center for Creative Arts in uh, New Orleans in the United States. Abby Stone is our OSL dating expert. She's at the University of Manchester. Dr. Rachel Bino is a, a lithics expert like myself. She's at the University of Southampton. Miss Karina Ephraim, who is doing her PhD at the University of Pretoria and is the curator of archaeology at the National Museum here. And she was a few minutes late, but that's not unlike Karina. And uh, Dr. Dominic Stratford, who is... Um, currently made a, a big life switch. He was the um, uh, a full full professor at Witz in, in Johannesburg, and his wife, who's a paleontologist, just got a job in the United States. So as the supportive husband, he rolled the dice and has moved over to the United States with her. So he's, um, he's currently at um, SUNY uh, at Stony Brook University. So that's our team. And um, we've been working in the San Sea now in the north of uh, the Sondab. Let me see. I'm going to use arrows if that will work. Nope, it won't. I will click. So you're all familiar with the San Sea. Um, why choose uh, the sand sea to work? Well, as you know, archaeologists, um, I'm assuming you know, we love deeply stratified sequences. What does that mean? We like to dig. We like to dig down level by level. And in a perfect world, we like to see young material at the top, a little bit older as we go down, 
a little bit older as we go down. And as we keep going, it gets older and older and older. That's the dream. Find yourself a nice little rock shelter or a nice cave where people were living for 500,000 years or a million years and sediments blow in the air. And then when they blow into the cave, that wind dies down, the sediments sit and slowly build up. And thus we can dig down and we can map cultural change through time very carefully and often date those layers very accurately. Who was here 10,000 years ago? Who was here 30,000 years ago, et cetera, et cetera. That is not the case in the sand sea. And uh, several years ago, I, I was ending a project in South Africa um, and my good friend, um, Dominic Stratford, who's on our team called me up and, and he had been looking at sites in Namibia and I had, I had done a little bit of work here myself years and years ago. And we had always been interested in pursuing the earlier stone age material in Namibia. And the reason for that is with the exception of a few very well known, um, Archaeologist uh, John Kinahan, for example, and and um, and his his partner, um, as well as some a few more recent archaeologists, there is very little done comparatively in the Namibian Stone Age, and I say comparatively because East Africa is a hot spot for archaeology and paleoanthropology. Southern Africa is a hot spot. Anywhere you 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 turn and look. There's an archaeologist. There's a paleontologist. We're bumping into each other all the time. And that's okay. But the problem is, is that is not representative of prehistory in Africa. Okay. When people say, well, where's the cradle of life or the cradle of humanity or something like that? It wasn't just in East Africa. It wasn't just in the cradle of humankind outside of Johannesburg. That's just where things preserve. Right. That's where the fossils fell into karst cave systems and preserved well. That does not mean that there were not as many hominids out in the Karoo, out in the Kalahari, up in the Okavanga, and out in the Sand Sea. It's just a lack of preservation on the bones. What we do know is that in places in the Sand Sea, there are stone tools that represent early stages of human presence and and pre-human presence so that's what we were interested in it all I, I i dare to say it almost came to us like a challenge here's a challenge we're abandoning you know i could find a perfectly nice little rock shelter somewhere uh, you know, South Africa, Namibia, where and spend the rest of my career happily digging a stratified sequence, publish a paper yearly on it, keep my funding going. But this came to us as a challenge because so little had been done in the sand sea. And we wanted to be the ones to break it open and be able to say something really interesting. How, I know a number of you have been through the Sand Sea, uh, a couple excursions um, going through, but this is a natural deterrent. You don't want to spend, a, well, maybe you do. I mean, if you're like me, you do want to spend a lot of time out there. But typically, nowadays, if we do spend a lot of time, we're lugging a huge amount of stuff out there. Now we're thinking about early human beings casually occupying that land, that landscape. It's been arid or hyper arid for probably 55 million years. Now, of course, that's fluctuated, but why are they there and how? Um, I'm just going to point out a couple of things. So we started this research in 2021, and since then, we have been putting out our research as much as possible. In 2022, we published our first paper, actually right here in the um, Scientific Society's journal, then we published our next one um, on NAMIB-4 in Journal of Field Archaeology. And this year, our most recent one came out in Quaternity Science Advances, which I'm going to talk about now. We've got another paper in um, press currently, or excuse me, in review currently. Um, but what we want to do is make sure that we keep up with our 
dissemination of knowledge because you know it's no good to anybody if you don't get out and talk about it that's why i love speaking to all of you so here we are this is the last time we spoke and i'm not going to go into detail about this because um this is just where i left you two years ago we were most interested in this site called namib4 okay um, Namib 4 is an interdunal flat. So you have the dunes that go up and down and up and down. And if you've driven on this, you know that in between them, you have these flats, some carved out by the ancient Sondab River. Some, uh, we don't know how they were carved out, right? But they are flat and that's where your stone tools are. Okay, so they are literally scattered on the surface. The last time this was looked at was uh, by an archaeologist named Myra Shackley, Shackley in the 1970s. And she took a, 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 she did a great job, but those techniques are a little bit dated at this point, And some of her interpretations we didn't agree with. So we went out and we took a very detailed look at it. And the first thing we noticed was that artifacts were not distributed equally across this landscape. There are actually clusters of ESA and MSA. What is ESA and MSA? The earlier Stone Age and the Middle Stone Age. Okay, that's what we're primarily interested in. Okay, earlier Stone Age, think in this region, think more like 500,000 years ago. We're talking about late Homo erectus, okay? So late Homo erectus versus the Middle Stone Age in this region. Think more in the ballpark of 100,000. It can go back to 200, even 300,000 in a few places. But we're talking about early anatomically modern humans, Okay, so those are the distinctions between ESA, earlier Stone Age, and Middle Stone Age. And it's that that we want to understand in this landscape. And what we noticed was there's a lot of topography. These are not flat pan sites, which it's always assumed. Oh, these flat interdune pans that you just can walk across quickly. They have topography. They have different deposits. Some of the deposits are sitting on calcrete. Some of them are sitting on Sondab sandstone. Some of them are sitting on dune sand. That means that those artifacts could be of different ages. Problem is that nobody wants to tackle that because we like our nicely stratified sites where we can dig down those layers and see the changes through time, right? Doesn't deter me. I say, no, no, we're going to go at this and we're going to try to tackle this problem. Here is that area. You can see it's, there's not a lot known there, right? So the Sondab flight you might, uh, you might be familiar with if we're going towards um, Solitaire and, and now we're coming west into the Sondab Flats, Namib 4 and Anatanab over there. Um, that's another um, earlier Stone Age site with Middle Stone Age as well. And a few of these had been reported as Middle Stone Age or earlier Stone Age locations. Narabeb was one of these that was reportedly uh, reported by Myra Shackley to have Middle Stone Age. We wanted to get deeper into the sand sea and see if there were changes in the technology in different locations. So that's what I'm going to talk to you tonight about is Narabeb. Okay, so our Narabeb work really took off. I mean, we visited in 21, but in 22, um, we really started our work there. Here you are, uh, just a classic interdunal pan, if you will in between the two north-south dunes. And the reason we took on Narbeb was because our dating specialist, Dr. Abby Stone, had actually dated some sediments there in 2010. And we thought maybe if we could link the artifacts there to her dates, it would open up a better understanding of how and when people were there. So we went to Abby Stone and I said, hi, Abby, on email. My name is George Leader. Any chance you want to come back to Narabab with us and see if we can date a few more things? 
And she said, absolutely. And now she's a, a, a wonderful colleague and, and, and friend. So we went back to Narabeb and we did sampling of the lithics. Now, we can't dig because all of the lithics are on the surface. So we have to randomly sample the pan and try to understand the technology, the stone technology that's there. And there's lots of it. Okay. There are points and cores and blades and flakes and all of the classic Middle Stone Age artifacts that you would expect to find. What is completely missing is any earlier Stone Age. There is no earlier Stone Age there at all, which is interesting because anywhere that you have good gravels and Middle Stone Age all throughout Southern Africa, if it's not stratified, you often have both. You often have earlier Stone Age and Middle Stone Age kind of sitting on the surface together. But again, without the proper dating of surface material, we've shied away from some of those, um, from some trying to answer some of those questions. So aside from all of the artifacts, now how can we attempt to date this? I'm not going to, if I haven't beaten it home yet, I'm not going to keep it. But again, not stratified. We can't date the individual artifacts. Those artifacts mostly have laid in one position on the surface. But of course, they can be flipped. There's a, uh, you know, I've been out there when I've seen the um, excursions, the overland tours going by. A tour rolls over and they can roll over a stone tool and it flips and it moves. Even... 50,000 years of oryx walking by can flip a stone tool. A hoof, it just needs one, one, one hoof to step on it every 5,000 years to move it. So the light and the particles that we normally date are unavailable to us on the surface, right? With OSL dating and things like that. So here's what we tried to do. We're assuming that these early humans only could occupy this landscape when there was a resource and a reason to be there. And what's that reason? It's certainly not the sand, right? It's certainly something that can support them being out there. Water, right? Water. So we're taking a leap of faith here. And not every archaeologist is going to agree with this. And in fact, admittedly, this is why I love science. Remember, sometimes in science, you, you, you don't know more than you know. And that's okay. That makes healthy, good science. But what we tried to do was date the water at this site, the presence of water. And what we found was that there were alternating mud and aeolian sand sequences through several meters of the dunes coming down. But specifically, we dug holes and looked at the stratigraphy and dated these layers in there. We dated two layers, one to about 200,000 years ago and one to about 130,000 years ago that demonstrate that they are sediments laid down by water. Okay, probably ponding, maybe a lake, believe it or not. They are not indicative of mo a heavy, high energy flow. So guess what? The good news is, is those stone tools I just showed you look beautiful in those date ranges. Okay, these are stone tools that fit perfectly with that time period. So what we've done is not actually dated the stone tools, but made the assumption that during these wet periods, namely phases around MIS 7 and 6 or MIS 6 and 5 transitions, but namely that human beings were able to occupy that landscape, make stone tools when there was some element of permanent or semi-permanent water there. Now, if you can picture a river running through a desert 
you also wonder how much greenery it can support on either bank, right? Now picture a classic, classic dune desert. Nothing of this American Southwest stuff. Classic dunes. But you might get a strip of trees on either side, and maybe that's it, of either side of the river, right? Or does it expand out for half a kilometer with scrub brush, right? How much, how much greenery, how much grass can a river like that support if it runs long enough? And thus, how many her, uh, uh, grazing animals can it support, right? That's questions that we need to be able to answer. Um, so what is driving these wet phases in the Namib Sand Sea? Now, the obvious answer is the ancient Sandab River, right? We all have seen that scar that goes through, and, and I had it in the earlier picture, that scar with the Sandab fly and then the Sandab flats, right? And that we always think that that is an ancient river. And it was, but it's not well dated. So we, we do have these conclusions that we've published on Narabeb that early anatomically modern humans at 200,000 years and maybe a hundred uh, uh, in between this period. So 200,000 years to 130,000 years with maybe minor sediments at 40,000 years um, were out there because they could be. But that leaves us with a lot of questions, okay? This is a mess. This is a, that's one pan site. Now, if you have ever been in the Sondab fly or the flats, and, and I've spent a lot of time, probably, I'm probably the, the American who has spent more time out there than any other American. I should get a trophy made for myself. But going farther to the West, these are still scars of that ancient system. And the, they get harder and harder to get to. The four by four, even the overland treks kind of avoid this region. Um, the, 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 scars, uh, the, the scars that we see out there from poaching, uh, those even start to peter off as you get farther and farther west. We just don't know much about out here. But look where the ESA is. The ESA, the earlier Stone Age, up here along the Kwisab, there's nothing, nothing happened. There's reportedly earlier Stone Age out here at a site called Narabeb West. We went last year, two years ago, to try to find that, and we can't. Uh, we don't know if the coordinates are, are not correct uh, for this, this reported site, um, but we couldn't find it. So what we have here, and, and then I say no material in here because we really weren't sure. We, we did a lot of survey work in here, and we couldn't find if it was earlier Stone Age or Middle Stone Age. So we came up with this plan this year we decided we wanted to do what archaeologists do in survey, and that is a transect. So anytime, this is very, very common in the United States, or, or you know, when a new building or a stadium or something like that is going to get built, archaeolog archaeologists will go out and they'll assess that land for heritage, right? And they'll walk actual transects looking on the surface or sometimes they'll dig small holes, test pits, every 10 meters or so, looking for subsurface deposits. And that way they can get an idea of the overall what is there, right? We decided we wanted a transect of the desert, of the whole desert, to help answer this question. So, last week, we walked it, okay? We started out in Solitaire, about five kilometers north of Solitaire on the C-14, and we walked it. 
one because as you know that you cannot drive on the pans out there you'll scar them and they're protected and two because driving would just not be possible out into the west and even in the last bits that you can drive if you come to a dune that you can't drive over and you have to go six kilometers north to find a way over and then six kilometers south it ruins the whole transect right you can't stay on that where we knew that if we walked we could look at a dune miserably but still go right over it and keep our transect we were interested and still are in the entirety of getting an idea of what material lies along the ancient Sondab River. Um, we walked it over 12 days and we recorded 55 archeological sites. Okay, so scatters of Middle Stone Age from the C-14 all the way until I think we got our last site maybe on day 10, almost all, almost entirely to the coast. Um, and we recorded 125 pan and landscape features. So what are those artifacts sitting on? Which pans do not have artifacts on them, which is just as important as the ones that do. And what does that information tell us? Um, and when I say we actually walked, we actually did walk this. And, and the idea was just that, to not have to go out of the transect's way, uh, but able to maintain a transect. And I, I wonder, when I, when I got the research permits uh, renewed this year, I wondered how many people saw this research permit and said, well, that, that sounds awful, um, as I was applying for it. But, um, but it was a really absolutely fantastic exercise because we already have come up with a lot of new questions, okay? Some preliminary observations from this transect. There is only Middle Stone Age along this entire walk, only. didn't even strike me until halfway through that that was important. It didn't even occur to me until here that we might not find any ESA at all. But why? I've looked at every single river system in Southern Africa, more so in South Africa, where I've been working for almost 20 years now than Namibia, but the Orange River, the Vol River, the Limpopo, every major river system has scattered in its banks, along its edges, near its gravel deposits, both Middle Stone Age and earlier Stone Age. Why not this river when it ran? So there are two things. We don't know the age of this river. We don't, we don't know very well when it ran. Our site of Narabeb demonstrates that there was at least a lake or something here, maybe from part of this river at 200,000 years ago. The Sondab sandstone is often assumed to be laid down by this river or rivers before it, but we now maybe can't even think of that as a homogeneous deposit. We have to rethink what we know. So I started thinking about it, and I got to thinking, I don't have them on this map, but where, where were all those ESA sites compared to this transect? Up north, right? They were farther north towards the Quisep. So here's our working theory. One, do we have a missing landscape? Meaning that these dunes that shift, they do shift very, very slowly, but maybe new dunes have covered up an older landscape and our ESA material is now meters and meters below the surface. I, I, I wouldn't even begin to know how to dig meters down in sand. I don't, I'm have to call in some miners or something. Or the other option is 
the Sondab, the ancient Sondab, which we have all assumed to be very old, is not so old. In fact, if it didn't run 500,000 years ago, why would ESA peoples, late Homo erectus, go there? I, I wouldn't. 500,000 years ago, we're not necessarily carrying water with us, right? 500,000 years ago, if there's no resources in here, forget about it. We're not going there. But if the Quiseb, on the other hand, was flowing, or option number three, I don't know, what option am I on? Five, four? Anyway, the, the Quiseb may have cut through at one point. And actually, there's a couple um, papers that, that, that suggest the Quiseb might have cut through towards the north a little bit. But maybe that was the draw for earlier Stone Age individuals. This changes. So here, here we have this, this really nice case of the archaeology changing our view of geomorphology and landscape evolution, making us rethink something. Oftentimes, it's the landscape and the landscape evolution that makes us rethink the archaeology. But archaeology is powerful in that way that it can also assist my, my good friends and colleagues in, on the geography, the, those, those nerds over there. And here, it's, it's really working out well. The Sondab Standstone, which is a hard red deposit that is exposed throughout different places in this region, may not be homogeneous. We see the earlier Stone Age sitting on top of it. And if there is a missing landscape, then perhaps we need to think about other north-south rivers and such in prehistory, having, having actually come through there and deposited other material. We have lots of fun things coming out. So this is all our, our, our research that has come out recently. Um, we've got a paper in review on Share Rock Shelter, which um, is right just north of Solitaire and just outside of the Sand Sea. We were, um, we, as part of this project uh, last year, we excavated a very small test pit there. And we wanted to see if there was a tie-in between a rock shelter, a more permanent location, settlement, if you will, um, and, and the sand sea. So we kind of wanted to see if there was a movement between what we call sometimes in archaeology a home base and resources in the sand sea. And it seems to be much younger. We dated something to about 7,500 years, and we're not sure that we're going to get any Middle Stone Age or any earlier Stone Age. Um, and we're already, in the last week since we've been back from our, our long walk, writing up our new thoughts on, on our transect. Um, so that is what we are doing. Um, it is an untraditional archaeology, if you will. It is a messy archaeology. It is a challenging archaeology. But it has been extremely rewarding so far. And if we can better understand hominids in the sand sea, hominids and early anatomically modern humans, um, it, it will surely open the doors for understanding many of the movements in, in arid landscapes across the globe for archaeologists. Um, the other thing that we're really excited about is the promotion of surface archaeology. Um, for 20 years, as I said, you know, we've, we've all, we all like our deeply stratified sites. Um, most archaeology still sits on the surface and still gets ignored. And frankly, um, it's also filling in a huge gap in our knowledge, Namibia in general. And where I want to kind of take that is the, the amazing box project that, that Ruth mentioned um, just a few minutes ago. Um, Namibia has just as much Stone Age, just as much archaeology as South Africa, as 
Tanzania, as Kenya, um, the attention it's received has been far less, probably because a lot of it sits on the surface. And we're hoping to change that. The 90 boxes or so, I mean, is that right, 90? <laughs> 250 boxes that the Scientific Society, I mean, cataloged over the last year have the potential to break open the door for archaeology in Namibia. And, uh, you know, R Ruth gave me the credit for, for finding the funding for it. Um, it was, it, it is not my intention to, to, privatize that to myself and my own team in any way. And I said that from day one, put it online, make it available to everybody. Let all the archeologists see it and get everybody interested in this. Now that we know where each box of artifact collected in the sixties is located, we can start to, uh, even if 10% of those are really con good contextualized sites, that's still two dozen new sites. And it can change what we know about Namibian prehistory. So that is the goal of this team, to, to, always, um, to always be open, um, to always um, share resources, and to um, hopefully blow open Nam Namibian prehistory. So thank you all very much for coming out tonight, and I will be happy to take any questions you might have. Yes. Yeah, the rhizoliths, the, the, the. Not, not in the Sondab sandstone, not, not in the Sondab sandstone. There have been no artifacts in that deposit. But again, I say that carefully because I don't know, I'm not entirely convinced that it's homogeneous. I think we see you know, if I go back to my map here, um, sometimes when we see Sondab sandstone, an outcropping up here, and it's a deep, dark red sediment that's, you know, very um, calcified. And what what's to say that the Sondab sandstone that we see down here is the same deposit? Or is it a different river system from a different time that was collecting similar sediments and laying them down, right? And again, I don't have a good answer for that because I don't know. That's just something we're working on right now in, in thinking through it. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and they were doing... Sure. Sure, yes, in the much younger period. So some of those eggshells, I think some of them were dated 12,000 years. I think we have a date of 33,000 years on another location. Yes, later, later, later human beings and, and later Stone Age and Iron Age peoples, I think very much exploited this landscape. But we don't have much of the later Stone Age. We don't actually have any of the later Stone Age evidence out here. So where that is really tends to be along the northern side of the Kwisep on the gravel plains. So what is their expanse into the desert, into the sand sea, I should say, is not always very clear. We have a lot of Iron Age hunting blinds and, and things like that on the edges. But and of course, we know that that modern day peoples can can tra traverse this this. Uh, into this sand sea for for long periods, 
right? So they're there, but going back, we don't know how far back they, they appear. Yeah. It, 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 yeah, it very, well, I mean, here, here's the other thing. If you accept that the Namib has been hyper arid for 55 million years, or the San Sea at least, then that's great. But does it still count if a river breaks through and runs through it, right? It's still accessible. Um, that doesn't mean that your annual rainfall is anymore, but it, it probably means that at least your rainfall somewhere else is higher, enough to have a high energy river coming through. We have gravels, large gravels documented all the way on pans way out here. Now, where are those gravels coming from? They have to be coming from this river system, right? But more impressively, the river didn't pick them up here. It's all sand here. And, and, and the Oswater conglomerate was not being decalcified by this river and gravels being pulled out of that. So that means that those gravels have to start all the way back above the escarpment and have been pulled all the way through by a high energy system. So there are times when, when I think it's, it's flowing pretty heavily for a, for a long period of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we, 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 we don't, we don't really know. <laughs> um that's a i mean that's a loaded question um i don't know the ages of all of the sondab outliers uh we we just have we don't have a good date on them and and most of the sondab sandstones which you're talking about as very ancient aren't necessarily dated very well. They've always been assumed to be very ancient. And if they're not as ancient as we think, that could change everything. But also, you're absolutely correct in that there are no known artifacts in those Sondab layers. So that right there indicates to me as an archaeologist that is older than even, let's say, the earlier Stone Age. However, <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't test that without dating it. I can't, yeah. Yes. So... Did we take any um did we take any samples of the mudstone? So we didn't. So our um we took samples of mostly sand sediments on either side of the mudstones because that's what we can date accurately. The mudstones themselves, um, you know, we're not always confident of what they're composed of. And the other issue is if you get too close to a calcium carbonate, it can mess with your dates. So we have to sometimes stay away from things that were, believe it or not, when we're trying to date something that was laid down alluvially, we're staying away from that deposit sometimes. Um, the, the, the actual dating that we used was a feldspar dating. Okay, We couldn't even use necessarily the quartz in it for, for luminescence dating. We had to use a, a potassium feldspar, which worked out really nicely. But we basically dated... And I didn't have a, a good picture of the stratigraphy there, but we dated the sands above and below. We've got, yeah, we we did, and the errors are quite low, and they're, and they're quite nice, yeah. And and that's that's only the the dates. Um, if you combine them with Abby Dr. Abby Stone's uh, 2013 paper on her 2010 work, um, 
those those dates are actually really really good too yes Sure. Yes. Yeah, so yes, that's you know when when we're talking about the surface, you're always you're always assuming there's a certain level of deflation, meaning that a heavy stone lays there and the sand from underneath it gets blown away and it slowly deflates onto a harder surface, and when different time periods meet on that harder surface and it resists that erosion, they end up side by side. So the assumption is when they are lying side by side, and we can very clearly tell that they're tools from a different period, um, that, that they, they started out at different levels. So um, yes, to, to, the short answer is yes, there's always deflation on these surfaces. But again, when you have a total absence of earlier stone age, there is no reason, there is no good reason that in 160 kilometers across this transect, we shouldn't have found dozens of earlier stone age sites. I mean, and I really mean that dozens, unless something is going on that the earlier stone age individuals are not there um, or again, a hidden landscape. Um, but I, I, that one, I, I'll get in a, I'll get in an argument about that hidden landscape another time. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we were, we were, we thought, and, and again, just kind of one of those thoughts that we thought we might find some later artifacts towards the coast demonstrating that later stone age or iron age individuals, peoples had been exploiting at the coast and then moving to the East, right. And moving and exploiting kind of the, the, the most Western edge of the, of the sea. Um, we didn't get any. We, you know, you start to find marine shells that are naturally brought in, or or birds, or, or things like that. Uh, just a, you know, ten maybe ten, ten kilometers or so away from the, from the coast. Um, shells, unless they're quickly buried, don't usually last too long in the desert. Um, Right, unless they're quickly buried. Right. Yeah. So um unfortunately, um no 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 evidence of marine usage is the is the short answer. That being said, if you go up to the gravel plains and you go to some of the rock shelters like Herb Tanks and Mirabeb, the those rock shelters definitely have people bringing things from the coast, including shells. So so there's there's a network of later stone age exploitation of the coast going you know 100 or like maybe 75 or 100 kilometers inland so it is there yep no um we did not That doesn't mean it's not there. So when we spend weeks and weeks at like a site like Namib 4 or Narabeb, we are literally on our hands and knees looking for pieces of, of fossil. And we do have, we have a, 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 a great fossil collection from Namib 4 and not so much from Narabeb. I don't think any actually. And along the way, when we were documenting sites, 
while we could take a few minutes at each site to look very carefully, we could not take all the time in the world to, to actually go across the entire pan each time. So each pan essentially gets one transect and that's just a couple of us walking. And so we're only covering maybe 20 meters as we continue our transect. And if a pan is 10 meters, you know, an interdune is 10 kilometers long, we have an idea of what's there, but we're not going to find, um, you know, if there's one location where fossils have preserved better than another location, it can be difficult. Um, I do think they're there in small numbers, but we, we weren't able to find them. Yes. Mm, okay, that's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so all of the stone tools and I, you know, I, I intentionally didn't give all of the details, but um, they're all made on different raw materials, green shirts, gray shirts, quartzites, quartz, you know, all these different types of things. And where are those sourced from? Right. So there are some gravel beds from the ancient river that lay out here and that we call those local uh, raw materials. But as you move in different places, you also have materials that don't look like they were so local. So what we can do with that and have done is use a portable X-ray fluorescence to try to get a elemental composition of the different stone types. So we can take that gun and point it at a rock and basically get a readout of its its atomic weight of, of, of the different parts of the elements in there. Um, we then take that gun again and go to known sources or other sources elsewhere, you know, in, in the different mountains and shoot them there. And then we try to link the most likely candidate for where those things are being sourced. Um, so geology itself plays a, a, a great role in archaeology. Yeah, gone are the days of an archaeologist, one archaeologist working a site. We, you know, we have teams of specialists, geologists, geomorphologists, dating experts, sediment experts, fauna experts, botanists. If we could get some ancient paleobotany done on the seeds out there, we're talking about leaf waxes, we're talking about residue analyses. Um, all these things are really coming together in archaeology these days. In fact, my job as the technologist is, is just one small drop of a whole project. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> no, there, there, there are some outcroppings of mud. So I'm going to have to send over our paper when we, when we write everything up, but, um, there are, there are mud flats in here. Um, you know, just how those relate to everything. Um, we're not entirely sure. One of the interesting pieces of data that we're hoping to um, put that um, with is the elevation data. That elevation data, um, not only at a, a macro scale, but on a micro scale. Again, when you come across an interdunal pan that are always sort of assumed to be flat and you walk down a dune, and then you look up at this pan of, of gravels in front of you, you realize that there can be a 10 meter difference between the start of the pan and the top of the pan. And on that pan, you could have 
literally a calcrete level exposed, a mud, uh, like a, a mud cracked level exposed, like an ancient mud cracked level, and a Sondab sandstone level. And that indicates to me right there that that's not necessarily saying that all of these were laid down by a east west river but that either there's that missing landscape or there might even be heck why not let's throw it out there i'm throwing everything else out there there might be a north south deposit a river potentially at some point um so yeah there, there's mud out there ancient mud yes Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That would be That would be fantastic. So if I may just pick your brain for a minute <laughs> or, or a couple hours, it, do you have any reason to think that the Sondab sandstone might not be a homogeneous deposit, like across this huge landscape? Do you think there could be several time periods of action? Yeah. Yeah. sure sure interesting yeah i'd love to get those resources for sure thank you that that would be fantastic thank you yes and then in, sure I, I couldn't tell you, you know, the farther we dive into the landscape formation of of the northern sand sea, the farther out of my area of expertise, um, really, my it's it's funny when I first mentioned when it first struck me as this lack of ESA is something significant. Um, my D Dominic, my, my colleague, who's a geoarchaeologist, he, he, he specializes in sediments and land formation within archaeology. He was having similar thoughts, not because of the artifacts, but because he was noticing strange things about the, the deposits that didn't make sense to him in an orderly way. And so when I brought it up, he said, actually, yeah. Um, so, so, um, so yeah, I, I don't know. To, again, to answer your question, and I love this about science is I just can't answer it. I just don't know yet. Um, and we'll hopefully be able to build some of that into the picture. Um, if we can answer one good question at a time as as y the years progress, then then we're doing something right, right? It's never about answering the a whole question all at once. You know, um, you know the 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 it's not it's not ever gonna just open up all at once. <laughs> yes.
Ooh. Yeah. For that, and in recent times, we would have to look at the grabbers. So, and, and, and the, the highest, it's an absolutely massive scar. So it's got to be, uh, uh, there are a few options. Either it's meandering for a long, long time. In that case, we should see patterns of how the gravels are deposited. Or it's a massive, massive, massive river, right? And the gravels that continue on the farther west we go indicate its energy at any given time. The issue is, is that when you're talking about deep time and prehistory, you don't know how many events that is. So a river can run for a million years and barely change, or it can run for 20,000 years and dry up completely for 20,000 more and come back for another 20,000, right? So as far as the time period of when those gravels are deposited, the best guess we have is guess what? From the archeology, span the Middle Stone Age. Now the Middle Stone Age in itself is a huge window. We know that it's at least 200,000. I mean, that's, that's based on our date, but based in general on Middle Stone Age. And we also, you know, it, can, it can, goes all the way until the, the, the later Stone Age, 40,000 years ago. So the, here again, the archaeology may be informing something on that, those gravels and that high energy. Um, beyond that, I don't, have, I don't have the data, right? I don't have the data to say. We need to drill a little bit. I'm going to have to find out what this gentleman's drilling with and, uh, <laughs> and what kind of techniques you're using there. So any other questions? Yes. Oh, well, a lot of different methods. What we used was a, a, um, a luminescence dating. Essentially, in general, what luminescence dating does is measure the last time something was exposed to light, sunlight. Okay, so meaning it was the last time it was on the surface. So once something is buried, it starts, it no longer absorbs that sunlight. It's dark. And then just like something that's radioactive and then starts to decay, the, the, what we're measuring is the decay of those particles of that radioactivity, essentially in different, um, in different, uh, materials. So we can do that with cosmogenics where we're measuring particles from outer space, hitting something and it absorbs. And then once it's buried, it decays. Here's the kicker though. It has to be buried to a certain depth because those particles go right into the ground and they slowly, slowly, as you get deeper and deeper, start to not get so deep and then it can decay. So anything from radiocarbon dates, which don't go back so far and you need organic material to luminescence dates, to cosmogenic dates, to uranium thorium dating, we've got it all now. Um, Archaeologists are really spoiled these years, these days. Um, we also get caught up on dates a lot, though. We, we, if if we don't have dates, it seems to, it seems to just get pushed off to the side. Yes. Good radiocarbon dating with a good sample, a well-preserved sample, has been pushed back all the way, pretty well into like a hundred to a hundred and fifty thousand years but you need a really well preserved sample because that signature keeps having every you know every five five and a half thousand years yes you're right yes Yes. And as far as dating is concerned, we're actually doing much more with artifacts themselves. I said how if something has sit, sat on the surface for a period of time, 
The underside could potentially be dated because it's been shielded for a long period of time. And further, um, there's some new interesting work on desert varnish on rocks and also the mineralization of that outer cortical layer on stones. So essentially, a number of, of raw materials absorb minerals from the air. And if we can measure that, we could then take mm, a core where you have a, 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 a stone that has had a removal taken off of it. And essentially that removal has reset the clock for dating it. So we get the outside varnish and we get the sec the removal and we might be able to date the time period in between, but we're not sure what good that does all the time now. So there's a lot of new technologies we're working with, but yes, you're right. Not, and that's why we love, that's why we're taking on surface archeology span because we've ignored it for a hundred years in archeology. span We really have. Yeah, yeah. So the dunes do migrate and move um, very slowly. Um, so essentially, that could reset a date if if we were sure of it. Um, when a dune that size moves over a deposit, we tend to be able to see that in the same way when a glacier moves over the ground, it scars the ground and any artifacts in it. Um, those dunes leave a signature across those artifacts. So we can usually tell which ones have been extensively bulldozed, if you will. <laughs> Right. Thank you all for your questions. I appreciate them. Thank you very much. Um, I see we had a lot of questions. The presentation will be on uh, our YouTube channel in a couple of days. Uh, the presentation, the PowerPoint presentation, will be available for the people who seek it. I have received permission to keep it. Um, with that, I thank you all for coming. I invite you to a beer or a wine or a juice and then you can pose some further questions to our expert. Thank you very much.